Hey guys, Drifter here. Call of Duty just released a massive document that details how it implements skill-based matchmaking in the game, what factors are considered, how it tries to match, what the goals are, and gives some examples. It's called Matchmaking Series, the role of skill in matchmaking. And it is a very, very chunky document. We're gonna, we have graphs, there's gonna be a couple of these like logic flow tables with matrices in there to represent all the different things that are being considered. This is a big, big meaty document. So today what I'm gonna to try to do is break this down for you as efficiently as possible so that it doesn't eat up your entire day trying to understand this tome of information. So I'm gonna go through this page by page talking about the most relevant things on each page in order to hopefully give you a good summary of the document. And if you hate skill-based matchmaking and you're here, I'll give a quick shout out to my sponsor, NetDuma. Uh, the NetDuma R3 gaming router has a lot of features on it that allow you to control your matchmaking, like what servers you do and don't connect to. So you can circumvent a whole lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today, but not all of it. And this is going to take so long to record, I'm actually going to move over to the bed rig. And now we're finally at the meaty part of the video where I bounce back and forth between gameplay and reviewing the actual paper itself here on the screen. So the paper is part two in the series. It's called The Role of Skill in Matchmaking, and it opens up very simply by redefining some variables and recovering some topics from their last white paper, which we covered in detail and is linked down there below. So I'm not gonna go into too much of this, but it shows the basics of their process. It defines some variables, connection, time to match, player diversity, voice chat, input device, etc. But then on page two, it starts defining some new variables relative to skill that were not included in the last paper. In this terminology section, we have a lot of stuff from the last paper up front. And then as we scroll down, a measure of raw skill, which is a single value representing a player's performance relative to the rest of the player population, a skill percentile, which is a value that represents where in the population a player's raw skill lies. And interestingly, one called skill disparity, which is the difference between the best and worst skilled player in a party or lobby, typically in the form of a skill percentile difference. Then one we're gonna see a lot is a key performance indicator, which is some kind of metric they wanna track against an objective. Uh, a little spoiler, typically this is gonna be playtime, lobby retention, quit rate, uh, things like that. We define team deathmatch, kills per minute, and score per minute. And after we've got all this terminology and definition out of the way, we're moving into the rest of the paper. The rest of page three is a little bit of some technical explanations of what they consider skill, how they measure it, how they want it to be constrained, how they want it to be highly predictive, and some other important scientific math type terms that we're actually going to skip and go on down to page four where they talk about how skill is calculated. In page four, they give this very interesting example of a team deathmatch game where they measure three different metrics and show how each one has benefits and also pitfalls. So they talk about in an average team deathmatch mode, you can measure performance by match total kills, which uh, will show you how well the player did at the main objective of the game. However, it doesn't really indicate skill because it doesn't take into account how many times the player died. It doesn't reflect the player's ability to survive. It just really reflects how often they can go into combat. For example, you could have somebody 10 kills in one death, and then 10 kills and 20 deaths under this metric, they'd be measured the same. So what's more common is we do kill death ratio, the amount of kills divided by the amount of deaths, which is really good, except it allows people to reverse boost. It doesn't account for self kills. So they defined a new metric, and this is how they countered reverse boosting back in the day. Kills divided by deaths per enemy is such a simple, mathematically sound way to more or less solve this problem. So it sort of uh, gives a really good example of how they approach skill and how they approach skill interactions between other players, which leads us into the next part on page number five, where they talk about player skill actually changing over time. And the developers have acknowledged a number of reasonable things that we gamers have talked about, that you could be tired, distracted, you haven't played recently, about 80% of you haven't changed the batteries in your smoke detectors, and that's probably really bothering you right now. So they talk about updating a player's skill value over time and on an ongoing basis so that it can find some sort of equilibrium relatively quickly because they don't want to overcorrect and say a player is bad or overcorrect and say a player is good because it kind of messes up matchmaking. So I'm very glad that they at least considered that. 
On page five, there's a section called why even track player skill? And they say one of the core design principles of Call of Duty is that it is a player first game and that players of all levels should have a fun and competitive experience with the game. And that's one of the main reasons that team balance is so incredibly important. So let's go ahead and move on down to page five and six where they talk about this feedback loop. Uh, one of the things that they want to avoid is the feedback loop of low to average skill players continually leaving the game as the average skill of the population rises. So basically, as the game gets too sweaty, too many people leave. They actually included this very painfully simple but absolutely perfect feedback loop. So as the average skill percentile disparity rises, that means uh, there's worse players playing against better players. There are tougher matches for lower skilled players. More of them quit more of them leave, and as more of the lower skilled players leave, they say this is very important because by catering to the lower skilled players, you actually help that top 10 to 20%. They say that if a low skilled player engages with our title less, then higher and higher skilled players become the new low skilled players, relatively speaking, as they get bumped down the hierarchy as the bottom leaves because they're getting stomped too hard, which ultimately creates a feedback loop, meaning the better and better players are gonna feel worse and worse at the game over time, i.e. being more sweaty. And they included this in the paper with this very simple little graphic, a feedback loop uh, between average skill percentile disparity rising, meaning tougher matches, uh, and that is really hard on low skill players. And as they exit the game, uh, it results in a shifting lower skill bracket. So now the lower skill bracket is much higher than it used to be. And newer lower skilled players coming in are immediately slapped by very difficult games, which is just a constant feedback loop and pushes people away. This is why games get much more sweaty over time. The next section is about team balance and they talk about how they try to do this properly. They talk a little bit about how small changes in team balances, even making them a tiny bit lopsided, can actually wield wildly unexpected results like having one really good player in the game and then a bunch of average players means that the team the really good player in is going to dominate. So they talk about that for a little bit. Uh, and then interestingly, at the page, at the end of page seven, they talk about testing and comparing match outcomes between titles in the Call of Duty franchise that have different skill implementations, which I do believe this confirms the community theory that different Call of Duty games have had different implementations of skill-based matchmaking. Uh, we've talked about that for years in this game, that some games games felt sweatier than other, that certain times in certain games felt sweatier than other launch, post-launch, a particular weekend, changes in Black Ops 2 and 3, uh, the difference between Call of Duty Vanguard and Modern Warfare 2019. Apparently, Call of Duty has been experimenting with different skill implementations over the years, which isn't really that surprising because that's what any good data analytics team should do, but it is something that they very rarely talk about. Page eight has something very spicy where they talk about the testing of different skill matching approaches. In the last paragraph on this section, they say, as an example, in early 2024, we ran the deprioritize skill test in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, where we used our A-B test framework to loosen the constraints on skill and matchmaking, meaning less skill matching. And it's important to note that skill as a factor in matchmaking was decreased, but not entirely removed. And they talk about how they ran this test sort of early in 2024 in Modern Warfare 3 to see this is we're talking about Modern Warfare 3, the most recent game. Obviously, I mean, that's 2024. So uh, and what happened is they essentially split the community in half. They had 50% of the population getting very little skill based matchmaking and 50% for a control group. And they wanted to see what happens. Well, what happened is, is it made 90% of the players less likely to return within 14 days. So the graph you're looking at here is the skill brackets in Call of Duty chopped up into 10. So the first 10% all the way up to the top 100% percentile. And this is what happened in the experimental group when they turned skill-based matchmaking off. The top percentile were much more likely to return, but then everybody from percentile 90 down to zero were significantly less likely to return to the game after 14 days. So what Activision is trying to say is that according to this graph, decreasing skill-based matchmaking, at least uh, decreasing it to an extreme amount, will actually cause people to quit the game because the worst players have a much harder time finding fun matches. And as that happens, this bottom bracket actually here starts falling off and some of these other people have to get moved down to lower percentile brackets, thus meaning that you're constantly draining the population of the game. This is Activision justifying the 
existence of the system. I'm not going to offer my opinions. I'm just telling you what the paper has to say. In this same test, they also decided to take a look at quit rate. And the graph is, again, pretty similar. So when we have less skill-based matchmaking, the quit rate for a game is much higher for every single group except for the last two in the highest skill bucket. The highest skill bucket quits far less. They're stomping people and enjoying their games. The second highest doesn't change very much. And then almost everybody else is quitting out of matches. And I think we talked about in the previous matchmaking video how people leaving matches and exiting matchmaking is something that greatly strains the matchmaking algorithm and forces it to make suboptimal choices in matching people. So as just a pure mathematical solution, they have a vested interest in not encouraging people to quit because the less people that quit, the smoother their entire matchmaking system works. So it is a, it's kind of interesting to see how skill can actually affect your overall matchmaking quality besides just the difficulty of the players. I mean, this would affect your region and ping and time to wait and all that kind of stuff. Page 13 has some very complicated stuff about match outcome differences between games across skill distributions, and they show what the predictive outcome would be for a low skill matching title, what the system they're currently using is, and the hypothetical maximum skill matching title, which you can see is almost identical all the way across the entire graph here. To summarize this very quickly, because I don't think this presents data very well, skill matching doesn't necessarily flatten the outcome graph, but it does reduce the severity of the slope, which means your extremes are less extreme, but the uh, trend in the graph is going to stay about the same. Page 14 has two paragraphs that I'm more or less going to read for you verbatim because they talk about different tests and impacts of skill matching. It says, we can see that loosening skill negatively impacts our ability to keep players interested in our game. In a test similar to the deprioritized skill test, we were able to see a significant decrease in the number of players playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 19 and an increase in the overall match quit rate when treated with a looser skill matching system. So according to this, the death of multiplayer of 2019 might have actually had something to do with them testing the skill matching system. And they said that subsequent attempts to protect the bottom 25% of players and allow for looser matchmaking for the remainder 75% of players had clear negative effects on player counts in two weeks. So it happened very, very quickly with increased quit rates and reductions in total hours played, both of which are well established as negative indicators of fun. And then another one they talked about where they did an inverse test where they uh, tightened up skill-based matchmaking and they noticed that the quit rate was down for 90% of players and we saw improvements in the experience of low skill players. However, we observed negative impacts for high skill players. As a result, this change was not rolled out as a standard approach in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 as we continue to strive for better balance in matchmaking. So they did at least test the opposite. At some point, they turned up skill matchmaking really high to see what happens. And apparently everybody liked it except the top 10%, which is probably all the content creators because they're all very, very sweaty. So uh, according to Activision, it benefits everybody but the top 10%. So from this point forward, the paper is actually about to get a lot more complex. I'm gonna try to do my best to continue to summarize and explain what it's talking about, but it's getting so uh, mathematical that it might feel like I'm just speaking numbers at you. So one of the other things they wanted to talk about on page 15 of the paper was skill grouping, which happens when you have a party, because we know that you know not everybody in the party is gonna have the same skill, that they can't, and oftentimes parties with friends and family and stuff like that might have wildly varying differences in skill. So how do we match parties of differing skills? Well, in the paper, they showed this heuristic selection process that they use to group parties of uh, similar skills. So the first thing to explain is how a single person would match before we complicate it with parties. A person having this matrix equation of variables, it shows three of them for actual skill statistics, and then their input filtering searches along with some number of other people in the same pool searching, and then they sort by all of these to try to find the closest match with all of these variables. And you'll notice here, they are also trying to find close matches with uh, matching mouse and keyboard instead of gamepad. And it's really trying to match these variables as friendly as possible. Well, let's scroll down and see what happens when we talk about a party, because this is where it gets way, way more complicated. So let's take a look at a three-player party 
with skills of 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and 0 0.9, having an average skill of 0.65. On top of this, you can actually see how they're kind of defined here. Uh, the algorithm will say they have an acceptable skill matching range of about 0.2, which means plus or minus 10 on either side, so they'll match with parties between skill of 0.55 and 0.75. So then they have to make sure that they also fall within these range constraints or that the other people searching are within these range constraints and they show searches A, B, C, D, E, and F all with different sort of variables here. And we start with step one where we search with the people in this party and we found a match. Step two is we take a look at this guy who has a skill uh, player skills of 0.5 and an acceptable range of 0 0.4 and an average skill of 0 0.5. You're gonna see me cheating so much. The problem with this, uh, he gets rejected from matchmaking because his average skill is lower than the average skill of the other acceptable group. Then it tries A and C. And A and C, everything is valid, everything is within the same range and we're all happy. The same is true of D, even though the average player skills are pretty low, they average out to just barely be within range uh, of, of the average skill, so we don't have to worry about that. But when we come to step E, we do kind of have a problem here. Whoever is playing in group E actually has a really tight acceptable skill range. This is probably because they're very close to being an average player, but for whatever reason, the algorithm has determined that they have a very tight skill range and they have been rejected from matchmaking. Then group F, to fill the last two players needed in the game here, actually fall within the average skill needed, uh, which is a 0.6, within the acceptable range. And then group F actually falls within the average skill range and the average skill, and they get matched and created a group. So this is all, I went through this so incredibly fast. They actually go through it here on the paper, step by step by step. But basically what it's doing is it's rejecting people that just have too low of an average skill, and it's also rejecting people that have an incorrect skill range. If the skill range is either too tight or too wide for a person, it will reject them from the matchmaking. And they say the reason for this is that these rules exist to primarily account for parties to aid in team balancing. Parties with high disparity are difficult to match fairly. Take, for example, two players with Alice and Bob. Uh, and this is, this is a very common example, a good and bad player. Uh, Alice is a pro and Bob is a scrub, which means that when they match together, it actually pulls that lobby average down. So what would happen is Alice is, as they say here, practically guaranteed to be the best player in every single lobby they join, even more so than if she played solo. So, and if we matchmake based on Alice's skill, then Bob's gonna be the worst in the lobby. So the system that they invented is to try to put them with other people that have a similar skill range and a similar average skill and a similar group composition so that you get as close to a fair match as possible. They do a very similar thing with skill disparity rules and skill disparity rules are defined as being concerned with minimizing the difference between the worst and the best player in the lobby. There is an extremely similar uh, graph and logic table here that talks about the disparity of skill in a lobby. They define it, you can see this first group has a disparity of 0.6 because the low is 0.3 and the high is 0.9. And then what they're going to do is try to match with an existing party with a disparity of 0.6 and accept an additional plus or minus 0.2 on top so it can go up to a 0.8 disparity. And then we're searching for that using kind of the same criteria here. And you can actually see that inside uh, a single group does not have any disparity because it's just one person. And they've measured the acceptable disparities of all these groups. Again, in example number two, they reject this individual player because his disparity is too low. And the algorithm will say he's more likely to find a more optimal match and a faster match somewhere else than trying to be put with this group. Then when it comes to searching for A and C, you can see that their skill disparity is very, very close to each other and they get accepted. And we see this repeated a few times over here. We do uh, reject somebody. We do actually reject group E because while the acceptable disparity and everything else is correct, their average skill is just outrageously low and off the charts. So they kick that off. It's not a single variable of matchmaking. Again, this is very verbose, very sort of complicated and might be better for you to slowly read through than me to just scream numbers at you the entire time. The next little fun fact is on page 20 where they talk about team balance and imbalance. 
and backfills, which is when a player quits, you have to have a new player join the game. And they say backfills never increase the existing team imbalance, or at least that's the goal. I'm not gonna expand on that too much, but just a fun little fact to throw in here while we're covering everything. The next section is a little bit oddly formatted and a little bit mathematically complex for what I think is appropriate for a Call of Duty video. So I'm actually going to skip ahead a couple of sections. We're gonna skip rank play, we're gonna skip a whole bunch of map, and we're going to move down to talking about matchmaking key performance indicators and the skill spectrum in Call of Duty and kind of round out this video. One of the neat things that they said here at the very end is that the population of skill population is highly asymmetric with most parties, particularly disparate ones, sitting in a higher skill distribution. The practical result is that matchmaking at the higher skill level requires more population to form equivalently equitable matches. So that's one of the reasons they actually want skill-based matchmaking. It's sort of justifying the system again. What they're saying is that they know that having uh, skill-based matchmaking is tough on the higher skill population, but for high skill population players, it's actually easier for them to get a match when there's just more population in general. But if you let skill-based matchmaking get too low, what happens is the good players dominate, they stomp the bad ones, the bad players leave the game, and the average skill distribution moves up and up and up so that it's more and more difficult to matchmake higher skill players at that level. That's actually something that I ran into in my initial like advanced warfare 10 years ago research into skill-based matchmaking is that the matchmaking was much more difficult and also much more generous in what it would allow once player skill hit a certain level because it was having such a hard time doing that. And Activision is saying that if we can maintain the low and medium skill population, that that will help the high skill population get proper matches. Though the matches the high skill population gets still going to be kind of sweaty. They don't really like those. And lastly, on page 24, when they're showing all of these bucket graphs, they state that higher skill players are more likely to play in parties which take longer to match make optimally. So again, something we as a community already know that once your skill level gets too high, it's gonna take longer for you to match make. And that is all for this paper. Guys, I hope you stuck with me through that Cliff Notes explanation of everything that was going on here. I tried to take a really complex paper and I wanna emphasize that this one is much more complex than the last one they were doing a lot more um, math and offering mathematical principles than I really want to try to explain in a Call of Duty video. So I tried my best to give you the Cliff Notes version, kind of shrink it down to cut out all the nonsense and just give you the fun parts of what Activision is saying. And I think I accomplished that goal, but as we discussed in the fake news series, you always lose some degree of information when you editorialize. So if you want to, you should definitely read this whole paper uh, yourself very slowly, especially the part near the end where I showed those sort of logic tree graphs uh, of matchmaking and stuff. Those are really complicated and don't really explain well in video form. But I do hope that you learned something useful. I hope that this video was helpful to you. I didn't really want to offer a lot of personal opinions and commentary here as much as I just wanted to explain what it is Activision was saying, what their opinion was, what they believed about all of this and what they were presenting. And the one opinion I will add at the end is that they're probably telling the truth here. Almost everything seems to more or less follow mathematically, logically. Uh, they have the research, they have the data, they've done the research, they're saying these things. It's all probably true, at least from their perspective. So this is a real paper, and I would highly encourage you to read it yourself. Guys, that's all for this video. My God, this was so hard for me to record. I cannot imagine how much junk, how much absolute, just like, <laughs> my hair got all sweaty. Uh, there's probably so much just laying on the cutting room floor, so many ums and ands, and I read a number wrong and restart. I'm so glad I did this from the bed. I'd have been at that chair all day. All right, guys, that's all for the video. Uh, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.